title of my talk is, as Dr. Devaskar said, um, Caring for Very Special Children, um, Subacute Care. The aim of the talk really is for most of you know, or at least certainly most of the house staff certainly knows, um, about Totally Kids, who these patients are. Um, some of you may not, and we'll define that, but we'll also, sh I'll attempt to show the greater picture as the role of what the, we're doing at Totally Kids and other places in the changing face of pediatrics and how pediatrics is not what it was 30 years ago. And I will attempt to um, show that and also to show, put that in context as well as um, to attempt you to show some of the projects that uh, I and my associates uh, have been working on. So without further ado, I'm supposed to give a disclosure, so I'm disclosing. Uh, I'm actually obviously compensated for my work as the medical director. It's sort of become my second day job as well as attending um, in the um, pediatric intensive care unit here at Ronald Reagan um, Mattel Children's Hospital. And I have no other conflicts. I'm supposed to say that. Um, so let me take you back a little bit in history and in time, way, way back to 1953 before many of us, myself certainly, uh, were born. And a place called, I think many of you in California may know, called Rancho Los Amigos. I believe it's in Downey, California, about an hour from here. And they were actually one of the first places to begin a chronic home ventilation program way back in 1953. And at the initial age of their time, they actually had two-year-olds who were chronically ventilated um, back then. And that sort of began on a national basis. Uh, they're actually, uh, actually part of the LA County system, uh, but they are nationally recognized uh, today as a rehabilitation center. Uh, but way back then, they began the, the, the journey that we are now um, describing. So where did all of this chronic care, and it's also indirectly leads to the origin of intensive care units. The intensive care units really began uh, in the 1950s with the uh, polio epidemics. Um, many of you probably don't know, and certainly uh, none of you recognized, uh, when the sock vaccine against polio, which we now take almost for granted, uh, came out in 1954. Um, uh, that was on the heels of tremendous polio epidemics that were happening in many of the large cities, um, especially in the Northeast. Um, it, it was so bad that um, summer camps, because it was polio, as you all know, is an enterovirus, that um, summer camps were keeping uh, children home in camp, not sending them back to the city. In those days, they used, as you can see here, this is sort of a modern version of it because there actually are still some patients who are ventilated with um, negative pressure ventilation, which is a iron lung, quote unquote. Now it's a little bit more, more fancy uh, and it's clear, but um, actually I had the privilege a number of years ago being at the Smithsonian in Washington, DC, and they had actually an exhibit of iron lungs and actually uh, iron lungs, uh, what they were. And remember, patients were not intubated. They were, uh, and, uh, but that led to the origins of the intensive care units. And as well as, and there was some small percentage of polio patients who never weaned from the ventilator. Uh, in 1977, uh, skip all forward about um, uh, 20, 20, 25 years, um, the LP3, which is really the first small home ventilator, uh, we've actually have used them in uh, the past. They're sort of a little outmoded today, but they were the first small home ventilator that was actually approved for use at home. And CHOP at the University of Pennsylvania was really the first place in the country to um, begin a home ventilation program. Um, and that really set the tone for a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about today. Now, of course, um, I know some people don't like to think about this, but you actually have to think about it, is economics, the economics of medicine. It's one of the competencies for the, for the students and the house staff um, in systems-based practice. Who pays for this? And this young woman, uh, who I did not have the privilege to know, obviously, but Katie Beckett. Katie Beckett was a young woman at the time who she and her parents uh, fought in the late, as you can see, she was born in 1978, in the late 1970s, early 1980s, to enable her. She had some sort of neuromuscular disease or chronic ventilation needs. 
and she fought the entire system, the entire federal government, literally, to get what's known now as the Katie Beckett waiver for Medicaid that allows um, Medicaid and, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the difference between Medicaid and Medicare, but um, keep in mind that Medicaid is a federal and state partnership, so the um, differences per state are, uh, are sometimes very dramatic, but she caused basically law to change to allow Medicaid to pay for her home care. And as you can see, she passed away in 2012. And it's actually known as the Katie Beckett waiver. Is this benign? This is not benign. And talk a little bit throughout the talk about some of the psychosocial difficulties um, for um, having a child who is chronically ventilated. Um, one study, and there are, I, I picked some studies, there are numerous studies, I picked some studies interested. This is a study out of the Netherlands, hence the windmill, um, uh, out of uh, Utrecht, the Netherlands, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that correctly, I know there are people in the audience who know how to pronounce it, but um, they studied 38 children on chronic ventilation, 12, via, via, 12 were via nasal mask, and 26 were ventilated via tracheostomy, which is sort of what most of us are more used to for chronic ventilators with certain exceptions. And they found that the parents were extraordinarily stressed and the fear was, and, and that's why we'll talk about later as we get to the discussion of how we send patients home, urgent suncturing. What are they gonna do if their child suddenly plugs their tube and are they gonna be able to respond? And however, this study showed that most parents, despite all of that, would actually indeed do this again. Another study, this is a picture of Calgary, um, Alberta, Canada. Um, looks like a very nice place. I've never been there. Maybe some of you have. Um, they looked at the parent experience of caring for a child with neuromuscular disease on home mechanical ventilation. And um, they looked at 15, uh, 15 families uh, with 19 parents. They interviewed the mothers and the fathers um, separately. And all of these families, or almost all of them, felt a huge recurrent loss of sense of loss and uncertainty. Uh, most, fe most felt that they had no choice, that this was hoisted upon them. They even described irritation years after, uh, the initiation rather, of home ventilation as very, very traumatic. They all worked hard to uh, maintain a normalcy in their life. But the two interesting things that I found um, were that a sense of isolation that they began to separate themselves from their friends, other family members. It's, they, you know, the, the paper discusses, they kind of were tired of answering questions. Why, how, how do you deal with this? And everyone noting that their child is so dramatically different than other child. So they began to close in on almost a cocoon of the immediate family and, and, and the child. And I, I know from personal experience, people who I've known, who I know of outside of the medical practice uh, feel very, very much um, the same way. And, and it was also interesting is most of these parents, it's a small study, no, no doubt, said they remained with some hope that somehow there would be a cure and this would not go on forever. Obviously, this, they needed this to keep them going. Very interesting. So even this home ventilation is not the simplest, most um, benign situation. Th children like these, these very complex children, are becoming very, very typical. And we all know this, that medically complex children are basically all over us. In this building, uh, I think we have an entire uh, uh, service is based on, on that. There was one study, and again, I, I picked, there's, I have a whole binder of studies. I picked some that I thought were most relevant to the discussion that we're having here. A study out of pediatrics in 2010 looked at hospitalization rates of children between eight days and four years. And they used a term, which I'll define in a moment, of, chronic, of, of complex chronic conditions. And basically what they showed, they compared uh, 2003 to 2005, Back, and they compare that from about 10 years before, 1991 to 1993, and the hospitalization rate actually doubled. Um, 
It, and it's mostly related to cerebral palsy and BPD, uh, mostly related to the uh, complications of our uh, NICU survivors, uh, but really double, which is pretty, pretty dramatic. So let me define the term for you. What is a complex chronic condition? Uh, it's, uh, I, I'm a little lucky to say it was the first defined, but what I, I, the definition that I found was uh, in this paper by surgeons of hospital readmission in children with complex chronic conditions discharged from subacute care. Uh, that's what the definition was. And it's defined as greater than or equal to one medical condition that is expected to last 12 months, one year, and involves several organ systems or one organ system that requires specialty care and likely hospitalization in a tertiary care center. So you can have multiple complications or you can have, say, one of our liver transplant patients who very often only have one problem, but they obviously need to be um, hospitalized in uh, a tertiary care center. And in sort of the lingo that we use in the ICU, we often, because many of our patients, as everybody knows, lives very far away, we repatriate these patients. They come to ERs or they're at some far place, and we bring them back because they need to be in a tertiary care center. They usually, although not always, they usually have special health care needs, either neurologic impairment or technologi technology dependence. And technology dependence is a trach, a G2, a Broviac, uh, a ventilator, uh, those, kind, those kind of things. Um, they're interesting. They account for about 20% of nationwide of pediatric hospital admissions, and they're about 50% of the charges uh, that um, when they do these uh, demographic analyses, which we'll talk about. Uh, in, in pediatrics. And just, I was just curious. So randomly, I took out one of my sheets when I was on service at the ICU a couple, a couple last week, two weeks ago, whatever it was, just to see. Any of that. And of the 19 patients that we rounded on that random morning, all 19 had qualified under this definition. So, uh, and when I speak to people in other facilities, when I speak to our friends across town at CHLA, it's, and we all know this, it's virtually impossible to walk the wards and find a patient without multiple problems. I mean, there are some. Occasionally, some of these babies in the winter with RSV, tra obviously trauma, but it's pretty unusual. And just randomly, uh, on a random day, all 19 patients who were in the ICU had multiple qualified for this definition. So it's an important definition, and it actually is something that we intuitively know, anyone who works in a place like Mattel, but uh, it's there. Uh, our experience is, is not um, a typical a study of admissions in 28 children's hospitals. 32.5% um, increase with two or more body system uh, uh, more body system failures or body system problems between 2004 and, and 2004 and 2009. And and I said you could walk the wards of every, any children's hospital from you know Boston in the east to us uh, here, as I guess we're as, pretty much as far west as you can go at, uh, in Seattle Children's or in, in Lucille Packard, you will find that it is rare to find a patient uh, on a pediatric ward or ICU without multiple um, medical problems. It's also a little difficult to know how many exactly patients there are. These are sort of surveys, and they kind of look at databases and inputs. Um, it's difficult to know exactly how many patients, and I'm not sure you can see this well, but uh, this paper, Long-Term Mechanical Ventilation in the United States, uh, did not, in respiratory care back in 2012, um, noted that there's no big database of all of these chronic care patients. So in 2006, according to the studies, as best they can tell, about, 20, as we said, 20 to 25 percent of bed days, and they, this study sh and other studies looked not 50% of charges, but about 30% of charges. And when we talk about readmissions, and, and that's a, lot, a big issue in hospitals and sort of you, the, the payers punish hospitals for readmission rates, uh, those children are greater than four readmissions, 89% um, rather, those children who had greater than four readmissions, 89% of them had more than four, four had multiple uh, chronic uh, uh, complications. and. Um, and one count, and again, this is only a count, this is not the count, it's a count, uh, from the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare um, in 2000 counted, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how they figured this out, but there were 4,886 children living in a skilled nursing facility, something like totally kids, 
uh, with 1,222 of them had intellectual developmental challenges. I'm not sure how accurate that number is. Of course, going back to home ventilation and these complex, you know, our friends across town have a very large experience. Uh, they published a paper of 228 patients on chronic home ventilation, 21%. What's interesting is e almost equal number of the patients in their study died as were liberated, as the term is used, which I don't actually really like that term, but it was actually removed from, cro from chronic home ventilation. But what's important, sort of tying some of the home issues together as we move to subacute care, is that half of the deaths in these patients were unexpected. In other words, something happened. Um, but there were no ventilator malfunctions, so the technology worked. But half of the deaths were unexpected. So you can understand why our friends in, in, in Calgary and other places have, and in, and in the Netherlands, have the families have such angst. Because families now, today, in the internet era, know this, that their child could die without suddenly. Just want to add that this, you know, sometimes uh, in here in LA or in the United States, we tend to look at things very uh, parochially. That's only an issue here. And I just there were a number of studies of places abroad, which I thought were interesting, just to show you. So in Genoa, uh, Italy, um, uh, it's very nice, right over the French border, not too far from uh, Monaco. Um, home mechanical ventilation in children: a retrospective study of pediatric population. And they looked at 20 children, um, but many of them were non-invasively ventilated. And those of you who aren't aware of what non-invasive ventilation means, it's a mask tied to, tied to the patient for some up to 24 hours per day, although in general, non-invasive tends not to be 24 hours, tends to be much more at night. And they also looked at their two children died, um, and many of these patients had very, very long hospital admissions. Um, and however, what they did look at was um, the cost savings. It, it saved about 7,593 euro, which as of two days ago was $8,266 um, on, on, um, for home care uh, per patient on a year, uh, per, I think this is per month. And on a yearly basis, it was, quite, it was quite a bit of money. So it actually is much cheaper to have, even in a, in a European system, I'm not exactly expert uh, on the Italian healthcare system, but even in a European system, it's um, much, uh, much, much less. In Boston, a similar study that looked, tried to count and identify, and in Boston in 2005, uh, hence the Boston Common, for those of you who are not recognizing this, um, there were 197 children who required chronic home ventilation in the entire state of Massachusetts. Uh, again, half and half, about 49% were with tracheostomy, about 50% were non-invasive. Again, it's usually what we call BiPAP or continuous CPAP or some variation on that theme. 1% uh, actually had negative pressure, as we talked about earlier, in the quote-unquote iron lung, although they're not iron anymore. Uh, if you extrapolated the number based on, if my math is correct, based on the population of Massachusetts, based on their electoral votes, you can do however you want to extrapolate, uh, it would be around 10,000 children nationwide who require home ventilation. Um, and we can expect about 200 children for every million children uh, to require home ventilation. And there are um, other, other studies um, as well. So this, all of this discussion, as I move to a, uh, a slightly different discussion, led to a clinical report from the American Academy of Pediatrics. And those of you who know, you read these things in, in pediatrics, these clinical reports actually are serious. And it was entitled in 2012, so recently, Home Care of Children and Youth with Complex Healthcare Needs and Technology Dependence. And it, um, definition of children and youth with special home care needs is defined as have or at increased risk of having a chronic physical, developmental, behavioral, or emotional condition, and also require health and related services of a type or amount beyond that is required by children generally. Now, obviously, we're not these are not only children who have trachs and ventilators and, and things like that. These are obviously behavioral children. All children with really very, very special health care needs. And it claims that approximately 10 million children in the United States who uh, meet this definition. So the, the, the well child who comes to the hospital for something or is cared for at home is 
one model. Uh, however, the vast increasing number of children who have very special health care needs is, is, um, uh, is, is tremendous. And again, going back to cost, um, this study looked at trends in resource utilization of children with neurological um, impairment uh, in um, healthcare system. This also was um, out, of, um, out of Boston. And it showed that they accounted for 5.2% of hospitalizations. And uh, those were mostly seizures and, and also cerebral palsy. Children with CP accounted for about 15% of hospitalizations. Sometimes we all think of uh, cere CP or cerebral palsy as sort of a static situation that they are what they are, um, but it's actually not, not true. Uh, and they accounted for 21.6% of hospital charges in this study. Uh, so something about 20% of all children use about 80% of all the resources. Uh, there was another study out of um, Ontario uh, in Canada where these little studies are easy to, to define because they have a single payer system, so you can actually extrapolate data. And that children with chronic uh, conditions, as we defined, use a third of the budget for all pediatric care, all pediatric care in the province. Um, and in North Carolina, for example, they identify 1,914 uh, medically fragile children. That means there's 63,800 nationwide, again, extrapolating from the population. I don't know. We all know that there are a lot of these children. Now, all of these children out there, and the vast majority, of course, are um, cared for at home, but there are some children who truly cannot be cared for at home. Um, reasons being they're just too complex. The family situation, uh, it's just not possible if you all live above a, you know, especially in LA where there are families that live above a garage, you can't have a child with a trach and a vent and all the other paraphernalia. It's just not possible. Sometimes they're, they're, the courts decide that these children cannot be living at home. Um, so the American Academy of Pediatrics issued another clinical report um, in 2014, and I would say this paper, and anyone who should, is interested in this field should read it, it's about uh, 10 or 15 pages. Um, really, this is the Bible of, of what we do at, at Totally Kids and in other facilities. Uh, this really defines, discusses, and uh, it's, it's actually uh, um, fa fascinating. Uh, these are really are the guidelines. It describes many aspects of the needs of both physical, medical, social, and educational, which I'll mention. Obviously, obviously, the goal in general is for all children to be at home with their families. There is no absolute question. And I'll, I will talk at the end about how, at Totally Kids, we really enable that to a very large extent. However, nevertheless, this report from the American Academy of Pediatrics concludes, parents of children with significant special health care needs may, at some point, consider out-of-home placement. Again, for just some parents, it's just not possible to care for this very, very special needs um, uh, child. So what is subacute care? So the origins, um, as defined, go back. The first rule in California, because, and obviously a lot of rules, um, the, the first rule is back in July 1 of 1983 when the Department of Health Services uh, promulgated that what subacute programs is, made provisions to patients' facilities who meet subacute criteria, and I'll give you the definition in a moment. And as far back as 1960, uh, before I was born, um, the needs of children and institution have been discussed. There's an article in Pediatrics 1960, um, uh, in, in 1960, quote, institutions are moving away from the cold, antiseptic feelings and are creating a warm, hopeful, personal, and good humored atmosphere which has unique treatment values of its own. This requires staff with the capacity for projecting itself into a child's world, sensing his needs. Um, I guess today we say his or her needs, his, uh, his, his desires and the best way to help him. So obviously this is not all that new. It's been discussed way back in 1960. So, uh, and then in 1995 became this, uh, an article in the uh, Annals of Physical Medicine and Rehab talked about subacute um, definition, uh, first definition, or at least first definition that I can find, of what are ch uh, children appropriate for subacute settings. And these include technology dependent, mechanical ventilation, oxygen support, TPN, and tracheostomy care. 
Um, and what's interesting, and I, and I actually found interesting, the staffing of this facility, remember we're, we're talking not a hospital, uh, should be family-centered and nurses with NICU or PICU backgrounds and others to assist patients and their families. I'm not going to go through all this in great detail, but just so you know, there are actually very strict rules of what the definition is and who may qualify for pediatric subacute. And that's defined in California. Um, in other states, I'm not sure. The rules may be different in other states, but I assume that they're all pretty similar, although there are not pediatric subacute facilities anywhere near all 50 states. Um, basically includes tracheostomy care with mechanical ventilation, or tracheostomy care requiring suction every six hours, TPN or other nutritional support, and a potpourri of these things, uh, which include skilled nursing to give intermittent suctioning every eight hours, IV therapy, IV pharmaceuticals, and, uh, uh, or more than one agent, peripheral line, central line, peritoneal dialysis. And we'll talk about it. We care for patients who have, as we speak, literally, uh, who have peritoneal dialysis with at least four exchanges. It's, so it's, it's interesting that the rules actually define how many exchanges they have. Tube feeding via nasogastric or gastrostomy tube, other medical technologies required continuously, which means the physician has to ask, beg, <laughs> Medi-Cal for a waiver to allow the child to be at, 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 at the facility. Uh, so it's not to bore you with all the definitions, but the point of this is to show you that these very strict definitions. The very rules are really very, very tight of who and who may or who may not qualify. And of course, if they don't qualify. We talk about nobody gets paid, <laughs> so it gets it gets uh, a little interesting. So let's kind of talk a little bit about subacute in California. Um, there seems, uh, again, since there's no, as I mentioned earlier, there's no actual database or or count. It seems the best on my work, <laughs> my ability, is there are around 300 subacute beds for, for children in California. And now if we extrapolate it again nationwide, that would be 3,000 beds for subacute. But I'm pretty sure that is there's nowhere near that number because I know that uh, talking to some of my colleagues who have been in other places, they just don't exist in sort of the, like in the southeast, uh, like in the Tennessee, Kentucky area, there doesn't seem to be any. So I'm sure there are less. I'm not exactly sure how many. And just interest in comparison, in the New York City area, uh, there are three facilities, none of them actually in New York City itself, but in the surrounding area, that also have 288 beds for comparison. Just, just I thought that was, I thought it was interesting. Um, uh, so the, what are these facilities? Um, uh, there are a few in Northern California, there's subacute in Saratoga, that's 38 pediatric beds. Uh, Health Bridge in Orange County has uh, 21. Uh, Rady Children's Hospital, uh, they have a facility, and I'm not exactly sure what the architecture is. Is it in the building? Is it near the building? Is it across from the building? Um, I know at, uh, in Philadelphia, at CHOP, at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, their facility is a, sort of like bridged over to the main uh, um, CHOP uh, um, facility um, on, on the Penn campus. Um, uh, TK Sun Valley, which is what I'm talking about and what I I'm, I'm know the most about, has 45 beds. Uh, there's a TK in Loma Linda, which is no longer connected um, to them, but it started out with some corporate connection, has 59 beds, and All Saints um, in, in North Hollywood, which is only about like 10 minutes from TK, um, has about 50 pediatric beds, but they also have adults. So most of these other facilities, as far as I know, uh, do not care for adults, um, except maybe the Whittier one. I'm, I'm not sure about that. So before we start this, sort of go and analyzing on what is exactly subacute care, someone has to pay for it, and who pays? So um, Medi-Cal is, the, for those of you who are not aware, I assume pretty much everyone in the room knows, but I'll say it just in case people are not aware. Medi-Cal is Medicaid. Medicaid is the federal program for the poor, as, as, as I mentioned, as opposed to Medicare, which almost exclusively for uh, those um, over uh, 65. Um, but Medicaid, Medi-Cal, Medicaid, and it's called Medi-Cal in California, it's called other things in other states, um, is a federal state partnership so that the rules can be different state to state. And um, CCS um, is California's Children's Services is special coverage for children with certain diagnoses, uh, 
chronic diagnoses, which obviously all these children would, would qualify. Um, and it's based on, so for so children with bad asthma qualify, general heart disease uh, also, and they pay as a secondary payer for uh, children's uh, health needs in California. And it's something actually, uh, in reality, those, you know, I'm not, obviously you could probably tell from my accent, I'm not originally from California, but it's something that I think that those of us who live here in California should actually be very proud of, because that is not universal and it's not available, that there is a backup care. And CCS tends to be mostly income independent, so it doesn't have to bankrupt uh, um, um, families. So in California, in general, and actually it's nationwide, private insurance is contracted Private insurance in general does not pay for uh, chronic care for children, for adults, for anybody. So when they come to TK, I have to speak specifically about TK, but the rules apply to everywhere, uh, private insurance is contracted for the first two months of their care. And then they must be approved for Medi-Cal coverage, which I believe almost always happens. Uh, and then that Medi-Cal coverage for their ongoing care is actually family income independent, which is very important because we know of those of you who've had, say, you know, uh, parents or grandparents who need to be in a nursing home, it can bankrupt the family because the coverage uh, uh, is income dependent and it's a very, very difficult uh, scenario. But for children, thankfully, it's not. Um, CCS, California Children's Services, does not pay directly for subacute care. However, they do pay for other stuff, like even such as special wheelchairs. A lot of these children in, in a facility need special uh, hand-designed wheelchairs and uh, uh, other physician services, but they don't pay for the facility itself. Um, how much? Uh, Medi-Cal pays $796 a day for a patient on a ventilator and $727.37, don't know how they get to the pennies, uh, for a non-ventilated patient, which is a patient with tracheostomy uh, in a G-tube in general. Um, I don't know where the dialysis patient fits in. I actually forgot to ask what that reimbursement is, probably somewhere in, in that range. So therefore, just doing some numbers, it costs about $290,540 a year to care for a patient on a ventilator in a subacute facility. Uh, that would be, if you take the, the beds I counted, uh, that would be about $82 million um, a year for all the pediatric subacutes in California. And obviously, that's not including uh, physician visits or equipment or medications and all the other stuff. It's really just basically, quote, I guess in the hotel business, you call it room and board, not the other stuff and not the doctor visits. But just keep perspective, it's always good to have perspective. The Medi-Cal budget this year, which the governor has apparently just signed, is $19.1 billion a year in California. So subacute for pediatrics is about 4% of the, um, if I did the math right, you sort of get lost with zeros, but it's about 4% of the Medi-Cal budget. So it's, it's this, these children are not really bankrupting the state. So just keep that in mind. I, I think it's important for that. Just a word about education, that these are children and all children go to school. And um, in 1990, President George H.W. Bush, the father, uh, signed the IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And that followed up on the Education for All Handicapped Children Act in 1975. Um, some of you may have heard about uh, the origins of how handicapped children are required by law to get education. Uh, these acts require schooling services for all children. In the past, handicapped children were excluded in, in many areas, and they were not obligated. Uh, and this led to the creation, as some of you may know, especially some of you who are uh, more in the outpatient world, um, and I find it funny as an intensivist that I'm involved in these things, but life takes a turn, um, IEPs for the children, some of the children at, at uh, Totally Kids, an individual, individual educational plan. Now, it doesn't mean that everyone has an IEP is so severely disabled, as everybody knows, but uh, all of these children have IEP, and every child gets educated. Frankly, we don't know some of them. Some of the kids at TK are fully cognizant and sort of near at or near uh, grade level, but those who are not what, what are they benefiting? We don't know, but we know there are studies that show even children with severely handicapped uh, benefit from things like music and other and reading and other interventions. Um, so at TK, um, some children actually go to school. Uh, when I first sort of got involved in this, I actually thought it was actually hysterical. But at 7, 7.30 in the morning, this bus comes. Uh, most of the children who are able, who are cognizantly, go to the local, one of the local elementary schools. It's in the, it's in the Northeast Valley, Sun Valley, so it's a little bit past Burbank. Um, and they go with their tracheostomy stuff and their G-tube feeding and all their stuff, and off they go to, to school. Um, 
And those who can't, or it's sort of not such a wise idea, or it's a little un, un, potentially unstable, two LA Unified teachers, really wonderful people, who come, who I assume they have some specialty in these children, who come every school day, and there they are, it's like regular school, and I'll show you the diagram of the facility, and they read, they interact, they do all sorts of things uh, with the children. It's actually, you know, it's actually quite wonderful that they, every day they're there, at least it's same people, I mean, same two teachers uh, come for the school year. So, so not only that, just as a side point, that all of these children um, get educated. In, in how they process it varies, obviously. So speaking about totally kids, and I, I'm using totally kids as an archetype of all the subacute facilities nationwide. I just happen to know this one a little better than it would be much more difficult for me to talk about some of the facilities, say, in New York. Uh, so this is sort of the diagram of the place. So you kind of walk in here. This is like the main entrance where the parents go in, and some offices, conference room, et cetera. And then you have um, uh, beds. Um, and I don't know if you can see on, on the screen here. So it says, because I actually can't on my screen here, but we have rooms that have four bedded room and, and a four bedded room, four, four beds. There's one, one single room. And probably the most frequently asked question I get is why aren't all the rooms private? And the answer is, well, I had nothing to do with the building of the facilities, A. Um, B, it's really not, it's considered not a good idea on long-term placement, that you want socialization, you want interaction. And we've certainly seen that some of the kids are more active, really benefit from the other kids. And also for the staffing, which we're going to talk about, it, was, it would be very, very difficult. Uh, you can't staff all these single rooms. So as you go around, um, so basically the little people, the babies and the little people, are more in the four bedrooms. And as you come here, we will have three bedrooms. Those are the bigger people. Um, non-toddlers non uh, uh, and, uh, and, and teenagers. The other thing they do is the children who are more neurologically intact stay in this corner here because uh, the nurse's station is over here. Uh, so no, we don't want anybody leaving because uh, there are children who are mobile and leaving would be would not be a good thing, uh, to say the least. And in the back here, just so you know, and there's obviously also there's other buildings too that have support things, and in the back here also there is um, a large activity room, and there are physical therapy rooms, occupational therapy rooms, teaching rooms, uh, and, and, and stuff like that uh, to, to do that. The doctors get this little corner room over here. We have a little place to hang out, but we don't really hang out there. But um, there's a very large room that has, and also all these rooms have set up for so oxygen and ventilators and, and all of this stuff. So during the day, um, most of the children are rarely in their room. They're actually either running around or they're in the activity room having the various activities. Uh, it's a 45-bed facility, as, as I noted. And the rule is uh, all, always is at least one staff member in each room at all times, 24-7. So there's never rooms are never left unattended. Um, and even in the middle of the night, where it would be very easy. And what they do at night, in my understanding, is they rotate them out every few minutes, the staff, because you fall asleep watching people people sleep. Um, and, and the other thing we've do, we've actually installed, actually, as of like two weeks ago, um, central monitoring, which uh, allows uh, everyone, everyone we require, it's not required by the health code, it's actually required sort of by our medical plan, that everyone, even the trait kids, are on a pulse oximeter overnight. We don't want to have, we don't want to have unexpected discoveries uh, in the morning. That would not be good. Um, so how do you run this place? There are 209 employees. There are 140 clinical people and about 69 support, administration, and those kind of people. And there are 25 to 30 respiratory therapists on the staff and 10 to 12 R RNs and um, 100 uh, between LVNs, which are licensed vocational nurses, sort of a, a step down, I guess it's a pretty significant step down from an RN, and um, CNAs, which are certified nursing assistants. Um, and the, you know, these are the people who really, uh, take care, of, directly take care of the children. And per shift, 45 patients capacity. So it's interesting, you have one, one RN in general, sometimes two. You have nine LVNs, eight CNAs. So there's basically 17 staff covering all of those rooms directly, and five or so respiratory therapists to cover uh, uh, about, and I'll tell you the, the rough uh, Patients on ventilator, and even those patients who need suction, although nurses can suction very well. So it's a very large, a lot of people, and this is 24-7. So you can come at 3 o'clock in the morning 
uh, which I never three in the morning, but I've come late and they're there. I, it's actually true um, what it is. So just to give you an idea of the breakdown of the 45 patients, all we do not have non-invasive ventilation. Uh, about half, uh, half the patients are on ventilators, uh, not necessarily all the time, but at least at least part time, uh, often at night, some are on full time. Uh, about half, roughly half also, or about 22 patients or so, are, have tracheostomy and G2s, and we have two patients on peritoneal dialysis. And one of those rooms we've set aside for these two patients. They get two, they take up two, two, two spots just to have, uh, 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 so that they can, the PD can remain as clean and sterile uh, as possible. And we've actually had very good success with that. It's been there for a long time. One of those patients, some of you may know, is from here, and one is followed at uh, our friends across town. Who are these patients? Distribution of diagnoses. So the overwhelming largest number of patients are complications of prematurity. Um, that, that's, uh, that is the overwhelming larger number of patients. Um, a number of patients have genetic diseases, a uh, variety of, you name it, uh, they sort of have it. Um, we have another, a number of patients with craniofacial uh, trauma, uh, including, I include in trauma AVM ruptures, which are, are really trauma. Uh, we have, as I said, two dialysis patients. Um, we have a couple of patients who, are, who uh, were resuscitated after drowning. Um, and, um, and some craniofacial patients as well, sort of a, sort of a wide spectrum of, of pediatric disease. We have some myopathy, which includes not only uh, um, not, uh, red nymalin, nymalin uh, sheath myopathies, but we also have had and have had patients with muscular dystrophy as, as well. We have one patient currently with muscular dystrophy. The average age of the patients there is almost 10 years. Uh, the youngest patient, we currently have no infants, although we often do, which is currently, because some of those infants have aged. So we have the average, the youngest patient is one, and the oldest is 20. Uh, eight patients are under three. Um, and uh, California law requires transfer of patients to an adult facility during their 21st year. So actually, the facility is not authorized to care for patients beyond, uh, age, beyond age 21. The, how long did I stay? Uh, the facility opened in the summer of 2004. The current patients have received, if you add it up, 84,000 plus days of care. Uh, the average length of stay, by the way, is about two years, is about, uh, no, not 48.4 months, um, about um, four years. Uh, almost all the patients come from NICUs or PICUs around the, originally it was thought that they'd all come from home. That's actually very, only a couple, a handful of patients actually come from home. Uh, where they can't be cared for any longer. I mean, it's one of the issues with some of these patients we talked about earlier about having these patients at home. When they get bigger, you know, it's very difficult to care for, you know, it's one thing to pick up the baby. Uh, you know, I always tell, you know, those of us who have children, certain age gets up, they fall asleep on the couch, you can no longer pick them up and take them to bed. You have to sort of wake them up and march them up the stairs if you have stairs in your house. Imagine a child with very special needs needing to be bathed and, you know, a, a TK, for example, the bathing. All the children, by the way, are dressed every morning. They're in pajamas every night, and the process is reversed. You would never know that these children, you know, they clothes from the family, the, fam the, the staff buys clothes, there's some money from the state for clothes, everybody's dressed. But it takes five, five staff members for some of the bigger kids to just to move them and change them. Imagine doing that, doing that at home, and we're going to talk about home discharge uh, coming up. And speaking about discharge planning, uh, that's one of the aspects of TK in our last few minutes uh, to talk about is the um, use of this as a resource for uh, research and, and um, it's almost a mini laboratory for optimizing care for these special children. Um, I was honored uh, in the summer of 2015 to participate in the Sixth World Conference on Disabilities and to present our data and our experience uh, on how we send patients home, which is the idea. Remember, we, we, as I said earlier, ideally for most children, ideally is home. And this took place in uh, Tel Aviv, Israel, it was sponsored by the Beit Izzy Shapiro, which is the largest provider of handicap services um, for um, the 8 million uh, people who live in Israel. And 1,000 people came to this conference from 20 different countries. It was really very, very cool. And I presented uh, what I'm going to show you now, how we discharge patients and the number of discharge patients. Obviously, discharging is very complicated. We have discharge planners. We have social workers, respiratory therapists, care coordinators under the direction of the uh, physician team. We require, as I said, the greatest fear in the studies that came out of Utrecht in the Netherlands and, and Boston and all the other places, greatest fear is suctioning. 
Uh, it's frightening, I have to tell you. If any of you any, any of you have ever suctioned a patient with a trach, it's, I mean, it's frightening. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, this is what I do for a living, basically, and it's frightening. So we require two adults, and we basically require uh, uh, a village of people. Two, one person cannot possibly be responsible for a child 24-7 who could plug their tube at any moment. So require them family, friends, neighbors, sort of other people. We require two adults. They all have to be CPR trained. They stay in the facility for 48 hours. We actually have a room, one of those rooms on the, on the diagram. There are no patients in it, sort of a lounge, where they move in, and there's a staff has a very detailed checklist that they got to go through, and they have to take care. And the reason 48 hours um, is because, to the, because we're most worried about the unanticipated plug or something like that that, that, that they, they would need to do. And we won't discharge somebody unless the care is documented. And sometimes the, some of the patients under the ward of the state uh, have issues with this, and uh, we really fight them uh, to prevent this. Uh, we go home. People from the staff visit the home because they find that uh, this is a house, for those of you who are not aware. Uh, not only is notifying the electric company that there's need power, which mostly is sort of from an international um, um, view, is that um, there are places in this world that don't have reliable power every day. I mean, you hear about cities in, in certainly in, in uh, Africa and in, in Central and South America. So how do you have a patient on a ventilator at home? That's obviously not, not really possible. I'm not really sure what they do. Uh, but also, um, space, living circumstances, is this really possible? Is there enough space? We also worry about infections and, and, and things like that. So we actually, staff, go to the home. Obviously, getting all the equipments, I think that the durable medical devices uh, is a whole issue, as you see, the ventilator, the suctioning, the oxygen thing, all of that kind of stuff are, are actually necessary. Um, we ensure the availability of home nursing, and we also know that home nursing is not reliable in general, and the family must be able to assume care if the nursing, nurses do not show up. We need to get authorization. Someone has to agree to pay for this, which is not always easily. Uh, we also make sure there are follow-up appointments, and many of our families are not English-speaking. Make sure that they're able to navigate the system in their own language, which is, in most cases, Spanish. Uh, they need to have a pediatrician. Now, obviously, every pediatrician should be able to take care of these children, but realistically, it's very difficult with the time involved and the and issues of uh, reimbursement. But they have to have a pediatrician who's going to coordinate their care. We don't, we're not able to follow these patients once they leave the facility. Um, However, we were able to discharge over 60 patients since the facility is opened uh, after 1.4 years, usually on average. Um, and uh, they were about four or five years old when they were uh, discharged. And just to show you, the orange, as you can see, is their time in, at TK. And the green is their, this is green, is their uh, length of stay, is their life, lifespan. And you can see some of these patients have spent significant amounts of time, this one and others, a significant time in the facility. But nevertheless, we were able to move them home, even though they've spent significant amounts of time uh, in their facility. And so we sent 60 patients home. Half of them were ventilated, so it's not impossible to send a patient home on a ventilator. Half, and only four came back. And, um, and for various social reasons, two of those four were later able to be discharged. And uh, as far as the 56 patients that were discharged, uh, everyone was alive at least one year. I believe everyone's actually still alive. And none were obviously admitted to another facility because that would not be a success, obviously. And lastly, to conclude in the last couple of minutes, is uh, infections, another area of laboratory. And I really have to credit Dr. James Lynn for working through this and working on this and gathering this data. Uh, it's a lot of work. And uh, it's a very, very serious uh, situation that we have, I think, again, um, done as a laboratory of what can be done to limit and, and, and uh, um, prevent this. Um, this is a paper that told the three facilities I talked about in the New York City area. This paper was those three facilities. Uh, they had an outbreak in three pediatric facilities, 700 cases. The vast majority were respiratory, and that's what we're really going to focus on. 36% of the, these children required acute care transfer to, to an acute care hospital, usually the ICU. Um, three of them died, two from RSV and one from the metanumavirus. And the most common was influenza A, despite universal vaccination, which we have and require, uh, and para-influenza virus. So this is what we have done, and again, the credits to uh, Dr. Lin. Uh, 
what we call is we've changed our whole antibiotic management. Um, our main focus, of course, is on respiratory uh, cultures and treatments for people. Uh, we have some small number of urine positive cultures. And again, green is the number of cultures and an orange is the percent positive over here. Um, and um, also, um, it's oh, even that area where we talk about is actually unclear. Uh, Dr. Lynn showed me some guidelines. It's unclear whether you need to treat all these urine cultures in a nursing home uh, facility, in obviously in the elderly, in, in adults. And also note uh, MRSA surveillance, which is a big thing in the hospital, the dramatic decline of MRSA surveillance. So what do we do? Uh, antibiotic resistance is a very significant threat everywhere, but especially in a facility where patients can stay for years. Interventions after seeing many cultures pan-resistant to everything, or at least everything that can be given orally or G2. Resistance obviously spreads to the facility. Also, our friend Clostridium difficile was a regular visitor. So what we call, what I call it, I call it the draconian no antibiotic policy. We almost don't give antibiotics to anybody except under very clinical circumstances. We've also banned inhaled antibiotics, absolutely banned. Some of our pulmonology friends love inhaled tobramycin. It's not allowed, and they get angry, but we do not allow it because it can spread resistance throughout the facility. So it's absolutely verboten. And it's required many staff interventions to understand what we're doing because they come from other facilities very often and, and, and they treat that. So just go by some of the more specific ones. So we had a concerted effort to limit our antibiotic usage. As you can see, ciprofloxin was our mainstay because a lot of pseudomonas and one of the few oral drugs that were sensitive to pseudomonas. And we only treat clinical. I mean, if they're really sick, they have a lot of fever, thick, foul-smelling secretions, et cetera. Uh, we've, done that. we've limited, as you can see, the falling amount of ciprofloxacin. Uh, respiratory cultures note the vast increase in normal flora um, and, and a decrease in positive organisms, and also the, the general decline in the need for cultures as we're not going to treat them why, why, why get them. And just to show you this, I don't know how well this projects, a pseudomonas, which my ID colleagues said they've never seen this. Random, this is common, the same for serratia, pan-sensitive to everything, which means if we have to treat them, we can give them oral antibiotics or, or treat them easily. They, my ID colleagues said they, this is unheard of. Um, staph aureus, same thing, pan-sensitive, not to penicillin, because all staph from like 1940 is resistant to penicillin, but fully sensitive to everything, which is really very important. And uh, also, we've had, as I say, without the evil eye, we've had no C. diff in the facility in almost three years, zero. And these are the children who actually die from C. diff. They can get complications of megacolon and what have you. So uh, this is very, very, uh, very effective. And we're actually trying to get this, we're in the process of writing this up. And it's very important that what we do. And just briefly, as in the last, last minute or two, uh, our MRS MRSA uh, has decreased by 65 percent. We've banned C. diff, which is not welcome. Staff is very attuned, and we almost have eliminated transfer to other centers. And just to acknowledge, I want to acknowledge um, all the staff who work there, all the hundreds of staff, the administration who keep all these rules in compliance, my physician colleagues currently, Dr. James Lynn and Dr. Julianne Harrison, uh, who really have devoted all of their, so much effort to keeping these children well. And uh, I also want to shout out to Dr. Andy Medikians, who was the first medical director who sort of forced me to come and work with him over there. So it wasn't, <laughs> so, and now it's sort of become a passion, a passion of, of I think, uh, advocating for these children is, is something we all should be doing. And our final goal, this is, I don't want to show too many pictures because I, sometimes I feel it's a little exploitive, but one of our patients sort of, uh, they took him to a horse, horseback riding place. I want to thank you very much. And